Hello there and welcome back to another exciting and powerful session from this series on divine healing. And if you remember on our last session, we started and we began the seventh chapter where we were talking about the main law of the kingdom. And I was saying that the main law of the kingdom of God, the way the kingdom of God functions today is by faith in the word. But we will see from the parable of the sower, we will see some insight on how the Word of God affects us, how does the Word of God get into our heart, and how to make it work into our daily lives. And we, if you remember last time, we, we read the main text from Mark chapter 4 verses 1 to 20, where the parable, where Jesus gives that parable of the sower. And we saw a few important things that every, all the people in the parable, all those four types of grounds, they all heard the word of God. Three of, out of those four categories of ground didn't produce any fruit, zero answers to prayer, zero results, zero promises fulfilled in their lives. And, uh, and we also, we've seen that the purpose of this parable was to teach us to be the good ground. That was that was Jesus's intention, not to just talk about different types of ground, but to inspire us to, asp to aspire, to want to be that good ground, which bear fruits 30%, 60%, or 100%. And we were saying that since Jesus mentioned the 100%, that means it's possible here on earth to have 100 fold of the promises of God that he has given to us fulfilled in our daily lives. And that's hope and that's exciting. That's powerful. And we've also seen in verse 13 of Mark chapter 4 that Jesus asked his disciples, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the other parables? In other words, this parable contains some key principles on how to unlock and understand all the other teachings and revelations of Jesus, things that he talked about the kingdom with his disciples, and implicitly he gave it to us through the Bible, through the Gospels. And today we're beginning the first subchapter of this big chapter, where we take step by step this parable and uh, develop, go more in depth and find out what the Holy Spirit wants to teach us through this parable. I'm sure there will be a lot of treasures, a lot of things that you might not have known. And let's be full of ex expectation and see what the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us, to speak to our hearts. So the first subchapter is entitled, The Sower and the Word. Be before we talk about anything else from this parable, let's define who is the sower and what is the word that is sown. Because we've underlined last time the words, the word and the verb to hear. And the, the thing that is sown in the hearts of people is the word. What is the word that is sown in people's hearts? And who's the sower? In verse 14 of Mark chapter 4, Jesus begins by saying, the sower sows the word. Now, who is the sower? Well, the sower is originally God, as we all know, because it's God's word. What is sown? The word, the word of God. So the sower is initially and originally God. And let's read one passage, if you have your Bibles ready, from Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, but you are welcome to use any English translation you have available. Let's read it together. It says this, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. But besides God, there are other sowers as well, not only God. So you see in this verse that the word that is sown is God's word. My word will not return void. It will accomplish. It will prosper. So it's God's word, but we are also sowers. There are other sowers too. I am a sower as I speak and I, I, I share the word of God with you. I am sowing the word of God. I take God's word given to me, how I understand it, and I sow it in other, other people's hearts. There are many sowers out there 
as you all know, every preacher is a sower. Every person who shares on the word of God with someone or testifies about the word of God is a sower. Some are wise sowers and others are not so wise, unfortunately. However, from what Jesus is teaching here, it seems that this parable has more to do with the ground than with the sower. The ground is the focus on this parable, the type of ground on which the word is sown. And the biggest issue is the way God's word is received by the ground, by people's hearts. Not so much how the word is sent, but how it's received by the receptor, by the persons receiving the word. And we have to hear it correctly, the word of God, and receive it in a right way. And I'm going to give an example here. If someone were to ask you after lunch on Sunday, what was the message of church about? Would you still remember what it was about? What did you take from that message? What about after a week from that message? Will you still remember it? The word of God needs to be remembered. So many times we hear sermons, we read books, and we take things from the word of God, and we keep it for a while, but then we lose it. We forget it. And that, that should not be so. Whatever we receive, we need to keep and uh, keep and refresh and refresh and then apply it into our lives and it'll, until it becomes part of us. The Word of God needs to become part of our, our self, of our nature. Now we define who the sower is. It, was, it is God and other believers. Now what is the Word of God or the Word of Christ or the Word of Grace that produces faith when you hear it. And I've talked about this earlier in other sessions. If you remember, I, would, I defined the word of God, but I will define it again here. This word of God that is sown into people's hearts. The word of God consists of all the laws that God has decreed and put in place in the spiritual realm, which apply to you and me as new creations. All the laws, all the promises, everything that he has spoken regarding us in the New Testament, regarding our new identity and which apply to us here on earth before the second coming of Jesus. That is the word of God that is sown into people's hearts. And that word of God includes your health, your prosperity, your success, your blessing, your uh, victory, these are the blessings. These are the laws and promises that uh, make up the word of God, which is sown into people's hearts. So whenever you hear a sermon or a teaching like you hear now, if it hasn't produced faith in your heart, meaning confidence, hope, joy, boldness, it was not the word of God that I'm talking about. Maybe there were verses from the Bible said there, but the spirit that the, that, the, that message was uh, spoken with and the content of that message was not based so much on the word of God, on these promises that are supposed to produce faith in us. We don't pray for faith. We don't need, we, we cannot increase faith. You receive faith when you hear the word of God, Romans 10, uh, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Faith, if you want more faith released out of you, you need to hear more. Hear more of this word that I'm talking about, about healing, about joy, about peace, about victory, about success, prosperity, favor. That's what you need to hear if you want more faith released out of you. The word of God produces faith and releases faith out of you. Actually, our spirit responds, our new spirits respond with faith when they hear the word of God. So the word of God is the testament that God left us about the inheritance that he has given us in Christ Jesus, which belongs to us here on earth. This is the inheritance that Apostle Paul talked so highly about. Those treasures, the, those superabundant uh, riches and glory that he talks about in Ephesians. These are, are the promises that God has given us. And this fortune, this inheritance, as I said, is huge. You might not realize, you'll think, you, you will think I'm kidding, but I'm not. This fortune that God has given us as new creation, new creations is huge. 
And it needs to be revealed to us in stages so that we can assimilate. We cannot get into all of it at once. We cannot benefit from it at once. We need patience and to enter into it uh, step by step in stages in multiple sessions. And the word of God, as I said in my first session, is the final authority in any area of our lives. There will always be a conflict and a gap between what the word of God, which is sown, says and what our experience says, what we see, what we feel, what we hear. And we shouldn't let experience interpret the Bible, but we should enforce the Bible on the experience to change the experience. Amen. God always speaks on purpose. He never makes waste of words like us. And everything he says, he expects it to come to pass. When he said in 1 Peter 2.24 that by his stripes we were healed, he always expects that word to come to pass. We are the ones who are not uh, who are ignorant and not expecting that word to come to pass. But he expects it to come to pass all the time. Because he speaks on purpose. Now Mark 4 verse verse 14 tells us that the sower sows the word. We've seen that when I read the parable. He he sows the word, not the words. He sows the word. God sows into people's hearts the same word that is already settled in heaven. There is a word which is established in the heavenly realm, in the invisible spiritual realm all around us. The word, what God has said about us, it's already fixed in the invisible realm, in the heavenly places. It's set. Nobody questions it. Nobody doubts it. That means he is convinced. God is convinced that what he said is going to come to pass. And we need to come to that conviction as well. Can you imagine that? God is convinced that what he said, it will come to pass. We are the ones that need to be convinced as he is convinced. And we can be convinced because he has put in our hearts the same kind of faith that God the Father has. There is a non-negotiable thing about God. God is always on the side of the sower. And not on the side of the devil who takes the word. God sows the word. God is on the side of the persons sowing the word. Not on the side of the devil who takes away the word that you hear. God and the devil have two completely different agendas. Two completely different plans for your life. God will never say something or sow a word and then decide to do something else. Just because you have character flaws or some other sins in your life, whatever God says or said remains in place. He will always stand by his word. He will not change like we do because he sees some weaknesses in us or some character flaws. He will always stand by what he said. He will not take his back, take back his word like the devil does. He changes, he steals the word. God is not like that. He's on the side of the sower. So we define who the sower is and what the word that is sown is. Now let's move on to the second subchapter where we start talking about the categories of people. And I said that in the parable there are four types of ground, four types of people. But actually there are five types of people. Which is the fifth one? Can you guess? We'll talk about, first we'll talk about this fifth one. The fifth type of ground are those people who don't hear, who never hear the word of God. They are not included in this parable, but there are so many people who are included in that type of ground, who don't hear the word. And Jesus didn't even mention them in this parable. Why? Because if you don't hear the word, you don't stand a shot or a chance to anything or at producing fruits. You must first hear the word. You must get into a position when you, where you can hear the word to have a chance to produce fruits, to, ful- to, to prove the promises of God and to see the promises of God fulfilled in your lives. You're, and if you don't hear the word of God, you're not even included in this parable. One of Satan's best tactics and strategies is to get you not to hear the word. Why? Because he doesn't even have to steal anything from you. 
You save him a lot of trouble if you don't hear the word. He will not have the, 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 to, to go all the trouble to steal that word from you. Do you understand? You didn't get anything. And he will make you busy. How many of you know that there are always more things to do than time? Always. You never write a checklist like a to-do list like I do. And then see that you have like three, four hours to spare and you don't have anything to do during the day. Does it happen to you? Maybe to some people it happens. But to most people, especially to super achievers, there is never a time where you, where you have just spare time, free time to, to, to sleep or to walk. And especially when you are about to hear the word of God, you will find out that will always, there will be always something else to keep you from hearing the word of God. Amen. Satan knows that if he can get you so busy to focus on other things and think about other stuff, no matter what stuff, but just other stuff, then you are easy to handle for him. You are a, an easy prey. Because you don't know the word. You are ignorant. You don't know what belongs to you. You don't know that you have power and authority over him. So he can handle you and deceive you very easy. He can control you and manipulate you very easy. When it's time to go to church, you come up with all kinds of excuses. There's a baseball game, a soccer game. You need to go out of town. You need to work. And that's all okay. That's all right. You're not less blessed. If you don't come to church, you are blessed when you hear the word of God and you put faith in that word of God. But there are some people who don't come to church for months. And even when they come, they say something like, well, I didn't find anything else to do. Uh, so I came to church. That's their attitude. And it's all right. It's good that you are in the church. The purpose is not just to fill a place and to have more people in church. The purpose, the interest is yours. Your, it's your interest to be there, to be in a place where you can hear the word of God so that you can benefit from what God has given us. Amen. So Jesus didn't even mention you in this parable because you don't have a shot at receiving anything from the word of God. So you need to come to a place to hear the word of God. Let's move on to the second type of ground and the third subchapter in this uh, chapter on the main law of the kingdom entitled the wayside ground. And let's reread Mark 4 verse 15 that describes this type of ground. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. This verse 15 describes the first type of ground. When they hear, Satan comes. When they hear the word, Satan comes. When does Satan come? When you hear. Have you ever left the church and had an argument on the way home or on the way to church? You just had a good service and have been in the presence of the Lord. And then something happens that distracts you from what you heard in church. Or it can happen on the way to church, as I said. Some kind of distractions. You're, you are encouraged. You are full of faith. And all of a sudden, something happens that distracts your attention from that word that you just heard. Satan comes. When you hear, he comes. Now, how fast does Satan come? Tomorrow or as soon as he has, has time? The Bible says that he comes immediately. Not tomorrow, not later on. Immediately. Why would he drop everything else and come immediately to you? Of course, Satan is not alone. He will not always come in person to you. But he has many demons and he sends out those demons. But their first priority is to come immediately to you to steal the word. Whenever you hear the word, they drop everything else and come over to you. Why would they do that? What does that tell you? It tells us that in Satan's opinion... Hearing the word is the top priority. Can you imagine that? In Satan's opinion, hearing the word is a top priority. Would we, would we learn from him that the word of God is top priority above everything else in this world? The word of God, to hear the word of God. Why else does Satan come so fast? Because he knows that if he doesn't stop the word right there, it will grow up. That's why he comes immediately. The word will grow. And if it grows up, he's got a problem now. A bigger problem. 
because then you have too much confidence and you are bold and you are solid on the word of God and he cannot control you anymore or deceive you. When you are confident, you know the word of God clearly, you know what it's supposed to be yours, you become bold, you become full of faith, solid on what you know, so you, he cannot control you anymore, he cannot deceive you. So you become a problem to him, that's why he runs so fast. So when you hear Satan comes immediately and gives you a high five, or Satan comes immediately and makes you a little uncomfortable. Or Satan comes immediately because he doesn't like you or he wants you to have a bad day. No, no, no. He has a very clear agenda. And Jesus is teaching us what that is. When you hear the word, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in your heart. That's his agenda. This is how the kingdom of God works. Every one of us has been ripped off and lost battles in faith. And this is why Satan comes and steals the word from our hearts. And if we don't know, if we don't even know that he's coming, then we will not pay any attention to him. And if we don't pay any attention to him, then we will be ripped off. We will not benefit from the word of God. He will steal it from us. And we need to be aware of that. Any distraction, any offense, anything that distracts your attention, your focus from what, from the word of God that you just heard, that's, that's Satan, that's the devil. He tr comes immediately and test it, put it to a test. See when you hear a good word in church, where you, for, on internet, or whatever, see how immediately you are distracted by anything in, in the, in the day-to-day -day life. You will see how fast things will start happening to distract your attention from the word of God. Let's read Proverbs chapter 4 verses 20 to 23. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Somebody might say, well, if it's God's will for the word to be there in my heart, then it will be there. That's not true. It is God's will for the word to be there. The sower sows the word. God sows the word. That means his will is already for the word to be in there, to be in your heart. God wouldn't sow the word if it wasn't his will for the word to be there. But that doesn't mean that the word will automatically be there. You have to get it and keep it inside. It's our responsibility to do that. If it's not inside or it's stolen, the word of God doesn't produce anything for the wayside ground. We're talking about the wayside ground. The first type of ground in the parable and the second for us because we said we, there are fifth instead of four. The wayside ground. Someone else might say, well, it wasn't God's will for me to have it. God knows what he's doing. You just, we just trust in him. Bless the Lord. He knows what he's doing. What have you done by saying that? You got off, you got off of what God said and entered into what it looks like he is doing. However, we are called to walk by faith and not by sight. We're supposed to stay on what God said, even if it looks like it's going into the opposite direction. We're supposed to stand firm in what God said and not try to imagine and guess what, what, is, what God is doing. Just stand on what he said. Wouldn't it be nice to just say, oh, God knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing, but he doesn't know what you are doing. He doesn't understand why you're not paying attention to this word coming into your heart. In some measure, we are all in this area where we don't receive fulfillment from all the promises of God. For instance, you might be, good, you might be on a good ground in regards to salvation, to the moment where you receive salvation. But when it comes to finances or to healing or to ministry or to family issues or things that frustrate you, you are not taking advantage of the word of God. So we, we, we all have areas in which we benefit more from the word of God and in other areas we don't benefit so much. And we need to fill ourselves with the word of God so that we can benefit as much as we can to, towards 100% from all the promises of God. Amen?
Another important issue is that when Satan comes to steal the word, he never identifies himself, but he comes in a very subtle and strategic way through the normal things of the day. He doesn't come and just say, hi, I'm the devil. I came to steal the word from you because otherwise it will be easy to identify him. But he comes in, in a very subtle way so that you will know that it's him. And he came with a very specific plan in mind. He would prefer you to think that it's the neighbor across the street or God or cancer or AIDS or it's just my boss who won't give me my promotion that I deserve. He would he will disguise himself in other people, in God, in anything else, or some kind of trouble during the day so that you will not notice that it's him or his demons. But the Bible says we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. The problem is that you gave up the word. The word is at stake here, not the people around you, not what they are trying to put in your path. Behind them, I'm not saying now behind every person is the devil, but most of the time when it has to do with the word sown into your heart, the devil would be behind all these troubles to come and steal that word from your heart so that it will not grow and produce fruits. Let's read one more passage from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. It says this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's what we're fighting with. Never forget that. We're fighting with the spiritual realm, not with people. Now let's move on to another type of ground, the stony ground in chapter, uh, sub chapter 4. And let's read verses 16 and 17 from verse 4, which describe this type of ground. Mark 4 verses 16 and 17. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises, for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. So the first thing we need to do, as I said earlier, is to get into a place where we can hear the word of God. And everyone is different. Everyone has their preferences and such. For instance, I bought myself an MP3 player, a very small one, so that I can listen whenever I drive, whenever I go to grocery shopping, anytime to have, the, uh, to have access to hear the word of God in my ears all the time. Why do I do that? Because I know what the word of God will do to me. And I don't know about you, but I like to win in life. I like to win in my ministry. I like to win in marriage, in raising my kids, and in every area of my life. That's why I listen to the Word of God. That's why I expose myself to the Word of God, because the Word of God does something into me. And never forget that the Word of God is top priority for Satan. He knows how important it is, how vital the Word of God is for you to listen to him, to it. And I already uh, swallowed the red pill, if you want, for Matrix. I already bought into this message of faith that Jesus left with that, that Jesus taught. And I realized that if I can get this word into my, into, my, into my ears in abundance, it will choke out all the other stuff and it will cause me to reap the fruits and the benefits of it. So bringing myself to listen to the word of God is not a hassle anymore. It's not a burden. It's not something that I'm trying to do. It's not on my to-do list, but I'm excited about it every day. Why? Because I know what the word of God does into me. It releases faith and power for everyday life, wisdom from above, in decisions, in, in, at work, insight, supernatural insight. Power to heal other people. That's amazing. That's what the word of God will do in us. Prosperity it will generate. It will give me power to make wealth and favor to my bank accounts. Everything about me, I'll live a supernatural life. That's why it's so important to listen to the word of God because it will lift you. It will exalt you like the Bible says about Paul. It will exalt you to a different plane of life. Amen. Second thing here about the stony ground, when you receive the word, let it get down deep into your heart, not just at the surface. Don't just let it come into one ear and get out through the other ear. Keep your mind on it, meditate on it, focus on it, personalize it for you, declare it with your mouth, keep it in your heart. Don't let your mind 
wonder at home, at your job, at what you're going to do, what you're going to eat. Don't let your mind go away when you hear the word of God, but be there, be present there. The stony ground receives the word with gladness. They perceive something, they understand something, they get excited, and it can stay, the, the word can stay there for a couple of days or weeks. But what does verse 17 says? It talks about tribulation. What is tribulation? It is a hard time. It is a time when things are not flowing as they are supposed to flow. It's just rough, hard times, unusually hard times, or things out of the blue. All of a sudden, something happens. How about persecution? What is persecution? People problems. Does everybody love you all the time? Of course not, right? So we experience tribulation, we experience persecution, and this is what verse 17 says. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, because of the word, not just any tribulation or any persecution, but tribulation and persecution because of the word. Why do hard times and people problems come out of the blue? For the word's sake. Isn't that interesting? You want to know why that happens? Because Satan couldn't stop you from receiving the word into your heart. So now he approaches you in a different way. He brings a few people problems in your way. What do we do when these problems come our way? We get out of shape. We get upset, upset. We retaliate. And what does Satan do? Thank you very much. He takes the word. I'll take that word from you now. And you don't even know it. You don't even know it when that happens. And he's thinking, these guys are dumb. They, are, they just don't learn. They just don't know how to learn. He comes and takes that word and he's using the same strategy over and over and over and we don't learn from it. It's true that he had ages and years and years where, where he perfected his strategy and we just have a, a shorter lifespan. But the Holy Spirit can give us the advantage to learn about his strategies and to not let him to take advantage of us. We should not be ignorant of his strategies as the Bible says so that he will not take advantage of us. So when we get out of shape spiritually, we start talking negatively instead of talking God's word. Saying things like, it's always happening to me. It's, Marthi, it's Murphy's law, man. It's always happening only to me. I knew it. And you speak into existence your own defeat. You don't realize it, but you do. Your words are giving Satan the permission, the right to do exactly what he wants to do. That's his plan to make you speak, to make you talk. And without you knowing, you give him permission for your own defeat. That's how he works. That's his strategy. Is God trying to make you to stumble through hardships? No, of course not. He is the one trying to get his word into you, to come to pass into your life. So does God wear different masks at times? Here he says one thing, but later he wants something else. Is God playing both sides? Or maybe you are confused about this. Persecution comes from, for the word's sake. So you stumble, you get offended. When you get offended, the word of God is taken away from your heart. So be careful. The next time you're offended by someone, you get upset. That's the time. That's the biggest, that's the number one strategy, how the devil takes the word of God from you because it distracts your mind. It makes you get upset, offended, and he takes the word. And then you cannot benefit from it. And if you stay long enough in that mentality that things don't work as God said it, you will soon change your theology. And that's sad and unfortunate. If you see for a long time that the word of God doesn't work for you as it's supposed to work, then you will change your theology. That's why are so many Christians today and even Bible schools and even uh, developed theologies that don't teach what I'm teaching here. Because they had to change their theology. They had to. And then you will start saying something different from what God said. So don't stay too long and don't buy into the fact that the word of God is not for today. Miracles are not for today. It doesn't happen. Don't talk that way because then you will change your theology. And then you will say something different from what God has said about you. One day you will stand before God and he will ask you why you didn't believe what he said and preach something else. Remember this. 
we will all give account before God for what we said, for what we preached, for what we told people. Let's read one more passage from Proverbs 18, verse 21. Very powerful passage. It says this, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Here is the power that creates your reality, creates life or death in your day-to-day -day life. When you go through difficulty, you should begin declaring what the Word of God says, that you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 37, that God is always leading you into triumph, 2 Corinthians 2, 14. This is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith, your faith, that's 1 John 5, 4. That's what I do. That's how you fight with the sword of your mouth. Your mouth will produce life. Whenever you are in the midst of difficulty, start using that sword. Start using the word of God to create life in your life. <laughs> Amen. Jesus says here, let me tell you why it's not working in this parable. You stumbled, you got offended, and you put away the word of God. When you are offended, you stumble and you put away the word of God. And Ephesians 6, 13 says this. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Amen. This is so powerful. So after we've done everything the word of God tells us to do, then we just stand on the word continuously until it comes to pass. After we have spoken, after we have commanded, you stay in your mind on that word. Persecution and tribulation will come at you, telling you that it's not going to work, that God doesn't love you. He's not going to do it for you. You messed up too many times. It didn't work for your papa or for your mama. It didn't work for your grandma. This is a generational thing. This is a genetic thing. All these things the devil will bring to your mind. The devil has all kinds of reasons why this is not going to work. What you have spoken, what the word of God says. But your job is to stand there and say, yeah, I know all about that. But there is something more powerful than that. And the word of God, which is settled in heaven and which brings light in the darkness. Amen. The word of God will raise the dead. That's what the Bible says. And our job is to stand on that word that God has spoken to us. Amen. So this is the stony ground. Which receives the word, perceives something, that, but then uh, they allow the devil to come and steal the word, to stumble. Uh, the devil puts some tribulations, some people problems in their way, and they get offended and forget about the word. And the word doesn't grow in them. Let's move on to the third category of people, the thorny ground, and the fifth subchapter in this series. The fifth subchapter in this big chapter. Uh, and let's read the verses that talk about the thorny ground. Mark 4, verses 18 to 19. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word, and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things entering in, Choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. So if hard times and people problems, as we said in the stony ground, external problems, all these external problems did you, didn't get you off of the word, Satan now comes up with another strategy. He goes internal. And going internal, it takes him a little bit more time, but it is a, a more sure strategy if he can get it done. The stony ground, in the stony ground, he came with external problems. Now, in the thorny ground, he goes inside of the person listening to the word. And the cares of this world, what are they? Are the worries. Whenever you worry, the cares of this world. Then the riches, riches of this world. The riches are not a problem, but the deceitfulness of riches is. And the, the verse is very careful in the choice of words. It says, cares of this world... The deceitfulness of riches, not the riches in itself, but the deceitfulness of riches, which is very different. So money is not a problem, but thinking that money can resolve anything and rely on money more than God, that's a problem. And the desire for other things and the drive to obtain them through natural means, that's the deceitfulness of riches. All these enter into the heart and choke the word. 
And you allow these things to come into your ears and plant themselves into your heart and you give them time to grow to the point that they choke the word. If you, how do you do that? You expose yourself to those thoughts, to those worries, to those ideas, those desires. You let them, you plant them into your heart and you grow them, you meditate on them, you think of ways how to obtain that, how to go about that. You, you, you focus your mind on them and they grow inside your heart and then they choke every piece of word that you had in your heart. You forget about the word of God and now you have something else in your heart and that is what creates your reality. And worry will choke the word so fast, probably faster than anything else. Worry is the opposite of faith in the word. If you want worry, it's also faith, but it's faith in the negative, faith in the devil, faith in the things that happen into this world. Worry is believing that something that you can't see is going to pass, is going to come to pass. And even psychology, listen, listen carefully to this. Even psychology says that over 80% of the things that we worry about never come to pass. Can you imagine that? And we worry in vain. We worry, we believe that something that we don't see yet will come to pass. That's what worry is. And 80% of those worries never even happen. So why worry? Why allow that negative faith in your heart into, the, into world circumstances instead of faith in the word of God that overcomes those circumstances? Oh, you feel some pain here and there, and immediately you start thinking and talking. Oh, it feels like cancer. I think I have a tumor. It's like a tumor. Oh, this is how it started with so and so. And you allow your mind to get filled with fear when you start talking about something that you feel, a pain that you feel. And I hear people saying things like that, speaking things like that, and I'm like... Don't say that, because when you say that, you create that sickness in you, if it wasn't there yet. And you have higher chances to actually get that sickness when you talk like that. Our brains are like magnets, our worry magnets, our physical brains. No matter how much you decide to get rid of worry and cast it to the Lord, it comes back to you like a magnet. Have you noticed that? Worry so, so much clings to us, comes to us so easily. You don't need to force yourself to worry. It will come naturally because this is the natural tendency of this world. The only way to choke that worry is by having more word in you than worry. That word will choke the worry automatically. So don't focus on getting rid of the worry, but focus on listening more to the word. And the word of God will choke the worry and the worry will go away when you hear the word of God. And the Greek word for cares is merimna. And the root word of merimna is merizo, which means divide or divided. And let's read one passage from Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, where it says this. It talks about this divided division. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. See this word, merizo, divided? Basically, you know the promises of God and what God wants you to have, but the cares and worries come and divide you against yourself and from what God has said. They separate you from the promises of God and from their fulfillment in your life. Here are promises of God. Here is what you experience and what you feel. And there is a division. You start separating yourself. If you allow those words that contradict what the word of God says, then you're divided in your heart. And so many times... We pray to God out of worry during the night when you cry desperately. There's something that's on your heart and you come to God and you start crying. And you think that that's a prayer of faith. But it's not. It's a prayer of worry. Maybe you declare the word of God during the night. You are, you are worried. You declare that declaration is motivated by worry. That doesn't mean that prayer or declaration is that good. It's good because it will relieve you. But it's not a prayer coming out of faith. It's coming out of negative faith, out of worry. 
And to deal with that worry, the, the best thing is to start declaring the word of God. I said previously, you declare in order to believe and then you start declaring because you believe. So that declaration will take you out of the worry sooner or later. So it's good. But in the first place, it's not coming from a, from a place of faith. That's why so many times our prayers don't work. Because without even realizing, we pray out of worry, not, not out of faith. And it matters what is in your heart when you pray. Are you awake in the middle of the night because you're scared out of your wits? Or you, you don't know what to do? You can use that prayer and declaration to build yourself up in faith. But a prayer motivated by worry is not a prayer of faith that's going to produce results. Amen. But when you get built up in faith and in the word, then you start declaring, then things are starting happening. And a prayer of faith is when you're sure God will come through and you're just thanking God for it. That's the place where you can know that it's a place of faith. You're sure that what you said, what you prayed, God will do it for you and you thank God for it. That's the, a prayer of faith, out of faith. Mark eleven twenty three 23 says this. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things that he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Whoever says, whoever says to the mountain without doubting, without merizo, without division, he will have whatever he says. Amen. This is so powerful. Such a powerful promise. Whoever, whatever he says. And then Mark 9, 23 to 25 says this. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Death and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. So you see here this father of the epileptic guy coming to Jesus. And when Jesus tells him that all things are possible to him who believes, he says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. What is that? That is not faith. It's a division there. He's divided inside him. He wants to believe, but on the other side, it's hard for him to believe. That's why he cries to the Lord, says, help my unbelief. I believe, but I don't believe. That's a division there. That's a doubt there. But Jesus nevertheless healed the boy with his own faith, not with the father's faith. And a divided person is not going to move mountains in his life. That's the truth. If you're divided, if you're in doubt, crying to God, it's not faith. Crying to God will not move mountains. But rising up inside like a giant, like a warrior and saying, mountain, you move out of my life in the name of Jesus. That's what is going to move mountains in your life. And whatever you say with that spirit, based on the word of God, that is going to happen without any division, without any doubt in your heart. Then things will start happening supernaturally in your life. Let's see one more passage about worry and about this division from James chapter 1 verses 5 to 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives most of the times. No, who gives all the times, all the time to all liberally and without reproach. And it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Did you hear that? Let not that man or woman suppose that he or she will receive anything from the Lord. The Bible is very clear. You will not receive anything from the Lord when you doubt. You will not receive anything from the promises of God in the heavenly places when you doubt. He is a double-minded man or woman, woman, unstable in all his ways, in all her ways. When you doubt, you are unstable in all ways, not in just what you prayed. 
Does anything from the Lord include healing, financial blessing, peace, joy? Of course. Yes, it does. It includes everything. Anything. When it says, let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Anything includes all these blessings. And you need to hear to receive the word of God. Hear it continuously and protect it in such a way that it will cast out every trace of doubt and you will be able to harvest the fruits of that word that you heard. That's why you need to hear and hear and protect so that every trace of doubt will go away and you will become fully convinced, fully persuaded of what God has said in regards to your healing. God didn't promise answers to prayers to people that pray long prayers and cry out to God and implore Him to do something. Even genuinely and honestly, you can be genuine about your cry. But that, God didn't say in His word that He will respond to that. You will do that to relieve yourself emotionally, but that will not make God do anything for you. Such people will never have their prayers answered. This, is, this, is, this again might be hard for you to receive, but this is the truth. Such people will never have their prayers answered. They will have zero answers to prayer. That's the truth. Take it in and take responsibility for it, for it and learn how to get your prayers answered. Sometimes God might intervene out of mercy. He, he might answer some of those prayers, but it's out of His mercy, not because of your faith. And that's not the rule of thumb. Not, that's not the way He expects things to work and he, the way He expects us to function. Amen? The passage, this passage in James says it plain and clear. Such a man will not receive anything from the Lord. It might seem very insensitive to you and me. Yes, it might be insensitive. Isn't he unfair? I'm trying to believe here. Doesn't he realize this? That I'm doing my best here to believe. Don't even suppose or think that you receive anything from the Lord. Amen? So even if it, looks, if it seems to you insensitive, that's the truth. You need to get out of doubt and in faith. And you hear people saying things like, Oh, we have people praying all over the world for this. As if the multitude of people... Praying for something impresses God. Do you think that will that the multitude of people praying for something impresses God so that God will intervene and do something? Do we need to implore God and bring more people to convince Him to do something? Do you, do you see the nonsense of this? But we do it all the time because everybody does it. My prayers are with you. Please pray for this. Please pray for this. And it's not, it's not bad if you don't have enough faith and you're weak in faith. Yes, ask for help, for someone in faith to pray for you. But the multitude of prayers or people praying for something is not the thing that will for, or bring results or will bring answers to your prayer. But the faith in, that, in those prayers. Amen? Or so many times you hear people say, oh, I'm praying for you. No, you're not. Most of the times you're not. You're just saying that. And even you who are told that, you know that because the people are busy. You know they have other words. They will not pray for you. And you know that inside of you, right? There are few people that when they say they pray for you, they actually take the time, do take the time and pray for you. So thank God there are people that pray for you when they say they do, but that's not generally true. And I don't like telling people that I'll pray for them if I don't do it. Or not do it. So whenever I say I'll pray for you. I, I decided to make a rule in my life. To, to If I know I won't pray to not say it. But if I say it. To just take time and pray for that person. Amen. Let's do that together. Then along the same line of thought. I want to say something else. That God never said. That if you can get enough of a quorum. Or enough people to pray for something. He will answer, and I'll say it again. God never said that if you can get enough of a quorum and enough people to pray for something, He will answer. And yet, we put a lot of confidence in that in, the, in our churches today. The devil deceived us again to put our faith in something that is not true. We put our faith in the multitude of people, and that's not true. Our faith should be in what God has promised to us. We should never have our confidence in the amount of people, but in the faithfulness of God. For instance, I, I had the privilege 
of being present at the Azusa Street celebration, 100 year celebration in Los Angeles, in California, uh, last year or two years ago. And there were multitudes of people and that's exciting. It's ex extraordinary to see so many people on a stadium. But what I didn't like, and that's my personal opinion, it's based on, I, I believe it's based on the word of God, is that they started to implore God and cry out for God to do a visitation in, in California, in that city and in, uh, all over the world. And the Bible doesn't say that uh, if we are many and we implore and cry to God, God will send revival. The Bible doesn't even tell us to pray for revival. We are the revival. Amen. We need to learn how to make the word work and to bring out the excellences of God, to proclaim his excellences. Matthew 18, 19 says this. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. See, it only takes two or three people of faith to agree on anything on earth, to agree on what the Word of God said, on the promise of God, and it will be done for them if they do it in faith, without doubting. There's no need of crowds or begging God for long times to see something answered. Amen? And I think we'll stop here with the thorny ground we still have a few things to talk about but we'll leave it for next time and we'll revisit this uh, this area of worry of doubt and then continue from there and until we see each other next time i pray that god will bless you and give you more revelation think about these things see how they apply to you we talked about the wayside ground about the stony ground a little bit about the thorny ground we talked about those people that don't hear the word of god we talked about the devil's strategy to steal the word to come up with external things then with internal things to steal that word because he thinks the word is the top priority so i hope these words will make out of the word of god a top priority for you so that you can benefit from the word of god and not just you but your family your friends people all around you people that come your way in your way in life and, and let's be careful, let's be aware of the strategy of devil so that he will not take advantage of us. Amen? Amen. See you next time.